in Panama's Pearl Islands, with nearly 90 uninhabited islands, mostly made of extinct volcanic summits, the couple decides to take on a challenge. They start on a rocky beach, where Ruth deduces from the driftwood and plastic debris that the beach is below the tide line, making it unsuitable for camping. They must risk climbing the cliff in front of them, crossing the island to a beach on the other side to plan further. Finding water is absolutely crucial. Fortunately, tropical islands usually have water vines. Michael, leading the way with a machete, also tried to find this type of vine. However, it was not a good start. The vine he cut released a white sap, clearly not the water vine they were looking for. But there's bad news and good news. They found a paper bark tree along the way. The inner layer of the bark of this tree can be easily peeled off and is suitable for use as tinder. Ruth collected some and put it in her pocket. As night approached, they still hadn't left the dense jungle of the island. Mikkel found a large tree with a dense canopy, where he planned to spend the night, using branches and leaves to make a mattress. Ruth cleared the ground to check for hidden snakes and insects. While chopping the tree trunk, Mikkel found the water vine, solving their urgent need for water. Because there was no fire, sleeping in the jungle was a torment. After dawn, they cut several water vines to carry with them as they continued towards the other side of the island. With the treetops ahead brightening, the couple knew they were not far from the coastline. Indeed, this was the case. Michael climbed a tree and saw that the beach to their right was suitable for camping. So, they headed in that direction and reached the beach by 2 p.m. Looking across the beach, they didn't see a single coconut tree. Michael and Ruth decided to set up their camp on a shaded part of the beach above the tide line. They had an unexpected find. Michael discovered a row of banana trees by the coast. Unfortunately, none of the seven or eight trees bore fruit, but they were still useful. Mikkel cut the base of a banana tree with his knife, revealing that the trunk contained a lot of water with a hint of banana flavor. He then dug a hole at the base of the banana tree and just had to wait about 30 minutes for fresh water to filter into the pit. Leaving the banana grove, they encountered a beach littered with trash. They found a good coconut among a pile of empty ones containing up to half a liter of coconut water rich in electrolytes and various minerals the body needs. The couple collected a pile of useful materials from the trash and brought them back to camp. Mikkel tied up a tarpaulin to create a roof and laid banana leaves on the ground to separate them from the sand, quickly finishing a simple shelter. As for the most troublesome task, making fire, he had previously found a screw cap and something resembling a roulette wheel in the trash. Using these, he made an improved version of a hand drill. By leveraging balance and centrifugal force, he easily drilled out tinder and started a fire. That night, they had to make do with eating coconut meat, but coconut meat is also a good source of protein, fat, and carbohydrates. Day 3 of Survival Early in the morning, Michael and Ruth planned to build a seawater distiller. Michael started another fire and built a stand over it, placing a bucket of seawater on top. Meanwhile, Ruth was tasked to find a piece of plastic from the debris. They cleaned and secured the plastic at all four corners. As the seawater boiled, the steam condensed on the plastic, forming droplets that slid down, guided by a stone at the plastic's end, into a cup below. Now, with water secured, they still needed to solve their food source. Earlier, Michael had found a piece of fishing net on the beach and, with Ruth, set the net in a mangrove area in shallow waters, hoping to catch passing fish and shrimp. While waiting for the net to yield results, they took proactive steps. Ruth searched the island for wild food, and Michael, using found nails, made two spears and went fishing by the shore. He noticed many stingrays in the sand, but catching them was challenging due to the limited power of throwing spears. Whether they would have meat tonight depended on the net. Fortunately, the nets did not disappoint, catching a black, unidentified fish that looked non-toxic and became their dinner. Earlier, Ruth had found an orange tree on the island, harvesting several tangy green oranges. Using these two ingredients, he made a citrus marinated fish, eating it directly soaked in orange juice. They slept until 8 a.m. the next day. Due to the tide going out, the nets caught no fish overnight. Michael and Ruth focused all their energy on catching stingrays. At this moment, the production crew's boat arrived. Michael quickly lit a prepared pile of plastic, creating a large plume of black smoke to attract the crew's attention successfully concluding their survival challenge. In this episode, Michael and Ruth ventured into the San Stodoro Mountains in Southern California, 
to explore for gold. Their donkey, carrying equipment, ran away, forcing them to survive with just an iron rake, a water bottle, a knife, and a jacket. The highland desert environment posed a significant problem with water scarcity. They climbed to the mountaintop to survey their surroundings. Michael spotted a dense forest in the valley, hoping to find water there. After a tough trek, they entered the valley. Although they found no running water, there were some remaining patches of snow they could use as a water source. Michael chose a spot on the hillside to make camp. Ruth collected branches for bedding while he searched for fire-starting materials. He found a piece of flint, which could strike sparks with his iron rake. Before leaving, Michael had filled his water bottle with high-proof whiskey, which now soaked the tinder, aiding in easily starting a fire with the sparks. After dark, Michael built two long fires, and he and Ruth slept between them to keep warm and melt snow for water. They survived their first night smoothly. The next morning, Michael made pine needle tea, which Ruth praised for its delicious taste. After extinguishing the fire and packing up, they continued down the valley, breaking branches along the way to leave traces for rescuers. It wasn't until the afternoon that they found a small stream. Michael dug a hole beside the stream with an iron shovel to filter the water before boiling it over a fire. They set up camp nearby in a spot sheltered by large rocks and abundant with acorns on the ground. Ruth collected these acorns for dinner. Michael used a sanitary pad as tinder, sparking it with flint to start the fire. He then went hunting with a helmet camera, hoping to catch rabbits or ground squirrels. First, he killed a wolf spider and stored it in his hat, then spotted a scorpion but found no trace of rabbits or ground squirrels. Meanwhile, Ruth crushed the acorns with a rock to remove the bitter tannins and placed some in a sock to soak in the stream overnight as breakfast. Unexpectedly, Michael heard noises in the bushes, thinking it might be a deer or a cougar, but found their runaway donkey instead. He led it back to camp. Ruth boiled the crushed acorns in a cup while Michael cooked the scorpion and wolf spider, first singeing the spider's hair. They tasted the scorpion first, finding it surprisingly crab-like and quite tasty. They filled up on acorn paste and slept soundly, but were disturbed at midnight by the restless donkey, likely spooked by something approaching in the dark. Michael stayed awake by the fire, suspecting a cougar, and let Ruth sleep. At dawn, indeed, he found cougar tracks not far from their camp, but chose not to worry Ruth with the news. The soaked acorns were mashed and shaped into cakes, baked on a shovel over the fire for a high-calorie breakfast resembling peanut butter pancakes. After breakfast, Michael hurriedly led Ruth away from the camp, aiming for lower elevations. By 3 p.m., their water was nearly gone, and they had not encountered any signs of other people. At the junction of two deep gullies, they tethered the donkey and searched for water separately. Ruth found only rabbit droppings, while Michael found moist soil but guessed it might require digging several meters, thus proving unhelpful. As night approached, they had no choice but to camp next to a rock. This time, Michael dug a rectangular pit and built a large fire in it. After the flames died down, he covered the charcoal with earth to create a warm bed that would provide heat throughout the night. They also built a fire nearby, ensuring a comfortable sleep. However, their fire inadvertently caught the attention of a farmer in the valley below, leading to an unexpected rescue. This challenge, located in the Blackfeet Indian Reservation in Montana, which spans 600,000 hectares of forests interspersed with grasslands and largely uninhabited, the couple, equipped only with a dragon-slaying knife, a half jug of water, and a full bottle of bear spray, decided to venture into this area. Michael planned to head downhill to find a stream where they could camp and wait for rescue, knowing that the Blackfeet Indian Festival was taking place nearby and that people would be collecting herbs in the wilderness after the festivities, offering a chance for rescue. Due to the presence of many black bears in the area, they needed to make noise while walking to alert the bears and prevent attacks. They walked until after 9 p.m. With the local daylight lasting 16 hours, managing rest was essential. Michael and Ruth found a flat area on the slope, laid down a layer of branches for a mattress, and took turns sleeping to guard against bear attacks. The next day's plan was still to find a water source, which Michael was confident would be at the base of the mountain. As expected, they found a stream at the bottom of the mountain. The water looked clean, but drinking it without boiling was risky. Michael preferred to start a fire and boil the water. The resources across the river seemed abundant, and they planned to cross over using fallen logs to camp there. Unfortunately, 
Ruth accidentally fell into the stream, which was very cold as it formed from melting snow on the mountaintop. Ruth quickly risked hypothermia, increasing the urgency for Michael to start a fire. He picked a campsite under dense branches with dry ground and began his fire-making task. Michael found several dry birch branches for kindling. Ruth, in dry clothes, went out to gather tinder to stay warm. Michael made a groove in the top of a spindle and used shoelaces to create thumb loops, preventing his hands from slipping and allowing more downward pressure during the fire-starting process. The base was simply two birch branches tied together. Ruth gathered some moss for tinder nearby. With the help of the improved hand drill, Michael successfully ignited the tinder and built a strong fire. Ruth warmed herself by the fire, and now it was time to consider food. She found nettle nearby, rich in vitamins and calcium. Selecting the tenderest parts, they cooked them for a nutritious meal. In addition to nettles, Ruth also found several thistles. Although their branches and leaves were full of thorns, once peeled, the stems inside were edible. They tasted somewhat like cauliflower stems. Today's progress was smooth. Entering the third day of survival, Michael decided to move their shelter to an open area outside, making it easier to be spotted than hiding under the trees. However, before building the new shelter, they needed to gather food. Michael and Ruth cut many thin branches and used them to construct a fence across the stream. They then built a trapezoidal entrance upstream, making it easy for fish to swim in but difficult to swim out. Michael also found many small animals like rabbits and squirrels in the grass. He dismantled his shoelaces to create two noose traps. The principle was that if an animal tripped the noose, continuing to move would disrupt the balance of an L-shaped hook, causing a bent branch to spring up and tighten the noose, suspending the animal in midair. During the wait for the traps to work, they built the new shelter. Michael, imitating Native American techniques, stuck long, thin branches into the ground in a circle and tied the tops together. He bound several horizontal branches around the middle part for reinforcement and filled the entire framework with leaves to complete the shelter. When Ruth went to fetch water, she found that their fish trap had caught exactly two trout. After struggling in the river, she managed to catch the fish and killed them with a stone, jubilantly returning to show Michael her catch. Their cooking method was simple due to environmental constraints. They grilled the fish directly on a flat rock. Hunger being the best seasoning, Michael and Ruth were very satisfied with their meal. They each obtained over 500 calories from the fish, though not much. It was comforting. After eating, they still had to take turns keeping watch and sleeping. The next morning, Ruth checked the fish trap again and found it empty. Therefore, Mikkel decided to make a weapon and actively hunt, also checking the noose traps they had set the day before. He chopped down a suitable branch and sharpened a stone with a sharp edge. He wedged the stone into a split at the top of the branch and tied the ends of the split tightly with rope. This setup not only secured the stone, but also prevented the split from widening. Originally, Michael intended to hunt in the grassland with this axe. However, one of the noose traps had caught a squirrel. Since the noose had tightened around its chest, the squirrel was not dead yet. Just as Michael was about to kill the squirrel, Ruth suddenly called out to him. She had seen two people on the opposite hillside while foraging for wild vegetables. The squirrel thus had a narrow escape. This challenge thus came to a successful conclusion. This couple came to the depths of the Appalachian Mountains in Kentucky. They removed their clothes and brought only a knife. Worse, Michael had a fever, making this challenge particularly difficult. Their survival plan was to head downhill to find a river and then follow the stream to find people. The forest hid many cliffs and steep slopes. A slight misstep could lead to a fatal fall. Faced with such terrain, the couple had to take detours. Michael, feeling unwell, relied solely on his willpower to keep going. Along the way, he found some goldenrod plants, whose petals could be used to make tea with fever-reducing properties. He tried some and found they tasted a bit like anise. At this point, Michael had to try to self-heal. By 4.30 p.m., the soil underfoot became moist. Michael noticed water seeping from the crevices in the rocks and guessed it was spring water, not accumulated rainwater, so it was likely uncontaminated and safe to drink. Near the spring, the couple found a protruding rock ledge, a natural shelter perfect for spending the night. Michael and Ruth cut some rhododendron leaves to lay on the ground and topped them with softer magnolia leaves to make a simple bed. On his way back after drinking water, Michael encountered a sourwood tree. Its leaves were directly edible. Although far from filling, they made a decent bedtime snack. 
After a night's rest, possibly helped by the goldenrod, Michael felt much better the next morning. While Ruth was still asleep, he went out to find edible plants for breakfast. Michael found some Virginia creeper berries, which were red all over with two small indentations on the surface and tasted a bit sour. Today, Michael planned not to continue traveling, but to make good use of the clear spring and find enough food nearby to replenish their bodies before setting off again. While exploring the area, they picked up several animal bones. Michael thought they could use these bones to start a fire. Ruth decided to try making a clay bowl to have a container for water. After splitting up, Michael found a bird's nest in the woods, perfect as tinder. Back at the shelter, he drilled a hole in a spindle with a bone and threaded the rope through it. This prevented the rope from slipping down during bow drilling, making it more convenient and less labor-intensive. Meanwhile, Ruth found a small pond where the clay could be used to make a bowl or a water jug. Besides, she discovered salamanders in the pond, which were easy to catch and could provide some protein. Michael successfully started a fire using the bow drill. He then joined Ruth by the pond, where he noticed several water lilies known for their edible, taro-like tubers. Digging up a few could provide a hearty meal. Back at the shelter, Michael tossed the tubers he had dug up into the fire to roast. Ruth caught seven or eight small newts, cleaned them, and skewered them on a knife to grill. While waiting for these to cook, she used some clay she had found to shape a clay pot. After about 15 minutes, the lily tubers were cooked through, looking and smelling like sweet potatoes. Satisfied after their meal, Michael pulled out a small tin box from his pocket. Michael planned to use this tin box to make char cloth. He cut a small piece of his shirt, punched a hole in the tin box, and placed the fabric inside. He then put it in the fire to heat. The fabric wouldn't burn, but would slowly char. The resulting char cloth would ignite quickly, with just a tiny spark. On their third day of survival, Ruth's clay pot, placed in the charcoal, was successfully fired. Before setting off, they drank as much water as possible, filled the small clay pot. Once everything was ready, they set off. The journey was challenging. A path estimated to take an hour on a map could take four to five hours here. In the afternoon, the couple found a nearly dried up pond with plenty of cattails growing in it. With both water and food available, they decided to camp and make a fire overnight. Michael planted some bamboo stalks in the ground, bending them into an arched shape and tying the tops together to create a shelter that could protect them from the wind and rain. For starting a fire, he used crushed tops of the cattails as tinder this time. While Michael was making fire by friction, Ruth went to the pond to pull some cattails for food. The white tender shoots at the bottom of the cattails were good to eat raw, while the starchy roots were better roasted. Now, with all four survival essentials covered, food, water, shelter, and fire, they slept well and woke up at 10.30 the next morning. The water they had brought was all gone, and Ruth's clay pot had cracked. Meikle thought of a new way to boil water from the pond. He asked Ruth to find some stones nearby while he dug a hole near the camp, lined it with his jacket, and placed some grass at the bottom for insulation. He surrounded it with stones for stability. Ruth found a turtle shell to use as a water container. They filled the hole with water and heated stones to drop into it boiling the water to kill any bacteria. Once cooled, it was safe to drink. After quenching their thirst, they continued their journey. Along the way, they picked some poison ivy berries as snacks. At around 3 p.m., they found a dried-up riverbed. Following it, they saw tire tracks left by humans and successfully found a nearby road, completing their survival challenge. Croatia's Velibit Mountains feature dense forests, and rugged high mountains with a complex network of caves below the surface. This episode's survival couple decides to take on the challenge here. During their caving adventure, their flashlight fails, leaving them with only a lighter, a first aid kit, and two dragon-slaying knives. Michael plans to find a breeze in the cave and follow the wind to exit. They wrap their cotton sweatshirt around a knife, pour some alcohol on it to make a torch, and use iodine as water purification tablets to sterilize the stagnant water in the cave. After resting overnight, at 9 a.m. the next day, they follow the wind and find the cave entrance, but emerge near the mountaintop, far from human traces. Michael realizes they are on the densely forested north side of the Velibit Mountains, near a minefield from the Crimean War era. Stepping on one could be very dangerous. After a brief rest, they carefully tread on rocky ground, climbing towards the mountaintop. 
planning to seek help on the southern side of the mountain range. Upon reaching the top, Michael spots a few beech trees with fruit. The couple eats some and fills their pockets with more. After reaching the summit, they see no signs of human activity or rivers. They decide to head downhill, hoping to find a river to replenish their water supply and follow the stream to seek rescue. They haven't gone far when Michael spots a dogberry tree ahead. Normally, red fruits have about a 50% chance of being poisonous, but Michael recognizes this as a non-toxic dogberry. The berries are sweet, juicy, and slightly peach-flavored. Michael also picks many as snacks for the road. The region's rocks are mostly fragile and sharp limestone, making the trek difficult. They finally take a break when they reach a large flat area. Michael initially looks for water, but a grouse eating on the ground catches his eye. He throws a stone at it, but misses. He quickly picks up another stone and throws it, startling the grouse into a nearby bush. Michael and Ruth go into the bush, but don't find the grouse. Instead, they encounter a small, high-nosed viper taking shelter from the heat. Considering its small size and the risk, Michael decides to ignore it and not pursue the grouse further. He opts to make a slingshot to hunt other game. Ruth stays to make a fire and set up camp. Michael cuts a Y-shaped branch and uses an elastic cord from Ruth's backpack. He uses a tag from his pants to create a pouch for stones, making a slingshot. After eating some beech fruits and dog berries to tide them over, Michael begins his hunting trip. After searching, he finds a grouse in the bush and this time, his first slingshot shot hits the target. Michael returns to camp to show his wife their dinner. During this time, Ruth made a fire, prepared their bedding, and gathered some wild thyme nearby to use as seasoning. Michael plucked the grouse, cleaned its innards, and stuffed its belly with thyme and crowberries to enhance the flavor. After roasting, the grouse was crispy on the outside, and tender, and aromatic on the inside. Michael couldn't wait, and started eagerly eating a leg. The grouse was all lean meat with a dense and firm texture. After finishing their last bit of water, they slept until 8 a.m. the next morning. Michael and Ruth packed up their gear and continued down the mountain, passing through a low shrubbery to a steep, rocky slope over 200 meters high. Below the slope were the river and lakes they had longed to find. Michael found a slightly easier path down the slope and patiently helped Ruth overcome her fear. They carefully made their way down and reached a lake at the mountain's base. Without hesitation, they jumped into the lake to wash off the sweat and cool down. Michael quickly filled their water bottles and used iodine to disinfect the water. Meanwhile, Ruth found several fig trees by the lake, laden with blue fruits rich in sugar, a true treasure from nature for survivors. Michael picked many while Ruth gathered them. He then found a small cave at the base of the mountain nearby to use as a shelter, planning to make a fire there for the night. The rocky beach had plenty of dry branches for firewood. Michael walked to the shallow part of the lake to sift through the mud, hoping to find mussels. Their hopes were met as the shallow mud was teeming with freshwater mussels. The couple quickly filled their pockets and returned to the shelter to prepare dinner. They cooked the mussels on the fire, and when their shells opened, they knew they were ready. While waiting, they ate some figs as an appetizer to replenish their vitamins and sugars. The mussels were cooked through in a few minutes, appearing yellow and appetizing. However, the taste left much to be desired. Michael noted they must have absorbed a lot of water-soluble limestone tasting somewhat like mud. Nonetheless, the protein was substantial, so they couldn't be choosy about the taste. That evening, the couple ate and drank well and slept comfortably. On the fourth day of survival, they followed the river downstream, passed through a dense reed marsh, and climbed over a steep, rocky slope. When Mikkel and Ruth reached flat ground again, they finally heard human voices. They approached and found several people camping, marking a successful end to this episode's challenge. This episode, Michael and Ruth take on the challenge of hiking in the Scottish Highlands, one of the least populated and harshest climates in the UK. The couple simulates being long-distance hikers lost in the wilderness. They find themselves at a high altitude with visibility around 50 meters due to dense fog. A strong wind from the west brings drizzle. Michael's plan is to head east to avoid the wind and rain and to find a river at the foot of the mountain. They hope to follow the stream to reach the coast and seek rescue. The plan is simple, but the execution is difficult due to cliffs, slippery wet ground, and low visibility, making it easy to fall and potentially fatal. The couple moves at a steady pace until around 4 or 5 p.m. Michael realizes they won't be able to leave the mountain before dark, 
so they start looking for a shelter to spend the night. Ruth finds a rocky outcrop that serves as a natural windbreak. Together, they gather more stones to build a windbreak circle and use moss to fill the gaps between the stones. Ruth fills their water bottle at a nearby spring, and they use water purification tablets from their first aid kit to make the water safe to drink after half an hour. That night, cramped under one raincoat, they weather their first challenging night in the wilderness. The next day, the weather improves and the fog clears. The couple continues downhill, now able to see a river and a forest at the base of the mountain, though they have to make a long detour to get there. They endure more wind and rain and reach the forest by 1.30 p.m. The area is home to small animals, allowing them to build a shelter in the forest, start a fire, and secure some protein to replenish their needs. The damp ground makes it unsuitable for a lean-to shelter, so Mikkel hangs a hammock and squeezes into it with his wife. They use the raincoat as a windbreak and roof to complete the shelter. Ruth collects dry moss from trees and grass tufts for tinder along with flammable pine resin. This white, pure pine resin is edible, sugary, but sticky and wax-like. Considering the environment, Michael finds it hard to start a fire by traditional means. He plans to use a broken flashlight. He extracts the batteries, removes the outer casing to expose the thin wax paper that separates the battery's terminals. Michael positions a fish hook under the wax paper. Twisting the hook to make it touch the battery terminals creates a short circuit. Then, he rolls up a bandage from their first aid kit, uses the heat from the short circuit to light it, and then lights the tinder, ultimately creating a strong flame. Ruth takes over to keep the fire going. Michael plans to make a bolas to hunt rabbits in the area. He finds three stones of the right size and ties a secure cross knot around them. He then tightens the ends of the three ropes binding the stones, completing the bolas. Michael searches for areas with rocks and dense bushes where rabbits are likely to burrow or forage. After an unknown period of searching, he finally spots rabbit tracks. He swings the bolus, gathering momentum, and throws it, but misses by a slight margin. Michael attempts to chase, but cannot run as fast as the rabbit. Continuing the pursuit, he finds the rabbit hiding in a grass pile beside a stone. This time, his throw with the bolus hits the target precisely. Ruth takes the rabbit to the river to clean it, then skewers it on a branch and roasts it over a fire. After half an hour, the rabbit is cooked and looks appetizing. Michael and Ruth tear off a thigh and start eating. Rabbit meat has much lower fat content than other meats, offering a chewy, firm, and aromatic taste. On the third day of survival, considering there are no trees by the seaside, Michael packs a bundle of firewood to take with them, hoping to reach the coastline by following the river. They come across a spot in the river with shallow water, a good place for fishing. They fold the hammock to minimize the mesh, and both hold it in the middle of the river. After some waiting, they actually catch a passing fish in the hammock. Unable to make a fire, Michael and Ruth eat the trout raw. By around 2 p.m., the couple successfully reaches the coast but finds it completely deserted. With no other options, they decide to walk along the coastline. After several more hours, they find a cave above the tide line with a man-made stone hut inside. Michael decides to make use of it and they spend the night there. He stays to make a fire while Ruth goes to the shore to find food. There are many cap shells on the rocks at the beach, feeding on algae growing on the rocks. Ruth also finds scallops, which are easier to pick. In no time, Ruth fills a water cup and a hat with seafood and returns to the cave. Michael, repeating his earlier method, starts a fire using a battery short circuit. They roast some of the mussels and cap shells and boil others in seawater, enjoying two different flavors of seafood. Both the mussels and cap shells are chewy. They have a hearty meal and sleep comfortably in the stone hut in the cave. At dawn, they continue walking along the coastline and encounter a family of three, marking the end of this challenge.